Hey, I'm Glenn with Labor Front. Tonight we have a special guest on Labor Front's Table Talk edition. Uh, John Ganan is a candidate for the International United Auto Workers Local U or Union, and he's going to talk about his vision for the union, his experience, and what qualifies him uh, to lead this massive union. So we'll get started right away. John, uh, tell us who you are and what you're about. Well, thank you for having me, Glenn. I appreciate it. Uh, what I am is I am uh, 78 years old. Uh, I am a Vietnam vet. Uh, I was elected as a union official in Local 136 for 13 years. And then I, I had the honor to be appointed to the crisis staff of the International Union. Uh, I spent 16 years on staff. Uh, in 19, June of 1995, Vice President Jack Laskowski appointed me the Assistant Director of the Chrysler Department. And at that point, uh, my responsibility was to take over all the negotiations for the Chrysler, Chrysler contracts. Uh, I got promoted approximately a year and a half later to the top AA of the Chrysler Department. And I have been involved in 11 national negotiations in my 16 years. Eight of them negotiations, I have been the lead negotiator. Uh, I was the top negotiator in the 1996 uh, national agreement. Uh, and in 1999, uh, I was the lead negotiator in the 1990 agreement. Uh, as you know, that agreement was uh, ratified by 86%. And uh, after the ratification, uh, I moved to eight other uh, negotiations that involved uh, what we call the national transplants of NUMI and uh, Mitsubishi Motors, also in bus engine truck, which included a uh, freight liner and Mack truck. And that's pretty much been uh, my career for 16 years. Uh, on staff and I retired uh, in 2002. Well, that's awesome. You've had a stellar career as a negotiator and 86% approval rating. It seems that most of the uh, votes that we have now are won by a slim margin. So you must've been doing something right as a negotiator for the UAW and bringing back some good benefits for the members uh, in order to get that high of a rating. You know, what do you hope to accomplish as the president of the UAW? Well, what I what I hope to accomplish is uh, I intended to try to see if I could bring not just this union back together. And what I mean by that is, uh, I believe our membership overall, uh, as of today, is uh, uh, they don't. They have not trusted the International Union, uh, the corruption that took place in our union has scarred us badly. Uh, the contracts have been very questionable over the last 14 years. Uh, I had a reputation and I, I think, uh, I don't think anybody will challenge the integrity and the trust I had when I was a negotiator and same as it, it, as it was when I was an international service and rep. Uh, I have been a proven negotiator, as I described in 99. Uh, that contract extracted $29,300 uh, in economic gains. Uh, if you took that package today, and you value and, and you valued it out under labor bureau of statistics, you would have to negotiate over sixty thousand dollars to meet that need in 1999. But again, uh, if you if you don't trust and you don't have the integrity, it's very difficult for a membership to believe in you. And uh, I believe again. Uh, what I have to concentrate my efforts on if I was afforded the honor is to see if I can bring this union back together where they'll have the integrity and trust that's needed. Well, the corruption at the top sure, certainly disenfranchised a lot of our members. And then when you add in some of the poor contracts that we've had, 
Um, I've been a member of the UAW since 96, and it's as bad as I've ever seen it. It's really frustrating, and it's going to take some strong leadership uh, to pull us together and, and get it. And I think the key to that is, is through proving through the negotiating process that you can bring some good contracts home. These companies are making at or near record profits every year for the last 10 or 12 years. And uh, as you well know, the General Motors went on a 40 day strike and we came out of that strike and really didn't get as much value as we should have for being out of work for 40 days. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me, let me say this. Uh, <clears throat> negotiating contracts uh, is, a, is an art itself. Uh, the more experience you have, naturally, I believe the better you become because you learn, you learn from most every negotiations uh, that you get involved in because basically none of them are the same. You don't exactly know what the outcome is gonna be when you go in. You might have your agenda uh, set. You're hoping to reach certain goals, uh, but that's not true in most cases. The contracts that we have been involved in in the last 12 to 14 years, um, has uh, been a little, I think, shameful to our membership. Uh, we went into a concessionary agreement in 2009, and uh, make no mistake, there was a recession and the car companies were in trouble, I'm not denying that. And there is a time that you have to stand up and say that the only alternative is a concessionary agreement. But using uh, the example that when you give to a company to turn the company around and make them become very profitable, uh, you also have a right to be privileged of returning what you gave them to make them successful. And here's something that I, uh, I do not understand. And uh, I, I hope to find out if I'm honored to get elected, why we have not extracted anything back out of the 2009 negotiations. And I gotta remember, we lost COLA. We, we inherited a two tier. We uh, have nothing for future retires or current retires. We do not have insurance for our two tier workers and we do not have a defined pension farm. Uh, myself, uh, I have a difficult time believing when you do three contracts after your concessions that you could not at one time or the other change the number of them things in the set of negotiations. Um, I know GM went out, uh, the UAW workers, uh, GM went out for 40 days. Uh, that's a long stretch on the street for a membership. I guess you asked the question, what did the 40 day strike bring above and beyond before they went out on strike? I don't have that answer. Uh, I, and I'll say this to any negotiator, I don't criticize, but being involved in 11 national agreements and eight of them as a lead negotiator, I questioned a lot of things that was done at that bargaining table for the members. I see. Well, what do you think are the most concerning uh, things facing our members right now in UAW? Well, I think it's pretty obvious in most cases. Uh, by what we're hearing from the membership and we've had an opportunity to talk to a lot of the leadership, uh, very fortunate. And uh, they pretty much give us a feel. I think we pretty much felt that we knew a lot of it, but we wanted to make sure that we were correct in assuming that. Uh, the two tier uh, is, in my opinion, shameful in many ways. Uh, I never, thought our union would be in a position where a company can dictate wages that they are today in two, on two-tier workers and on the S-1 employees. Uh, you really think about 
an individual working two tier, in most cases, he will not be able to buy a home to raise his family until after he has maybe eight to 10 years. And that's truly shameful. He cannot buy the product he builds. And if you're in the early part of the two tier, I don't know if you can even afford to take your kids out for their birthday or take your wife out on her anniversary because the money is not there. Uh, we have made these companies such as General Motors, Ford, and Sir Lattice. They are making billions and billions of dollars. And I'm not talking uh, the last three, four years, I'm talking all the way back almost to 2011 when they turned. Uh, uh, did they ever come back to the union and say, thank you for all that you gave us? And did they ever offer to bring one thing back? Apparently the answer is no, because we couldn't even extract it across the table. So what, what I believe is you've got COLA hanging out there, you got pensions hanging out there, and that's what we talked about the two tiers. I don't know if there's ever, ever been a contract that had so many big hitters that need to return back to the membership. Because this is a true grocery list, and it's very long. Normally, when you go into negotiations, you might have one or two big hitters that you can hopefully negotiate. But we are we are in a position now over the last three contracts that we put ourselves in a very difficult position. And I say this uh, to all members, I would only ask you to do one thing in this negotiation, venture candidate out, vent the best you think you're gonna get at the table and vote them out. But, but do one thing, totally vent your, your candidate out for president and make sure he's telling you the truth. It's all good stuff. And one of the things is, it to actual tier two worker myself is I will not have health care when I retire. Uh, that was given up in the 2009 negotiations and with General Motors and the other Chrysler and Ford making record profits, it seems kind of bad that uh, we're not going to be able to get health care when we retire. <clears throat> Moving on. So why should members vote for you? To me, a question, the answer is obvious. But there's a lot of people out there that are going to have questions. What would be the reasons they should vote for John Ganan for president? Well, the, the question you ask now, I think, in my opinion, and, and the people that uh, are working for me in regards to that and get elected, uh, this, this question should be asked to every candidate that's running for president of UAW. Uh, it's, it's a question that uh, you say, what are my choices? And I'm gonna try to walk you through your choices. The board of the International Union is one of your choices. And you have looked at their performance the last 12 to 14 years. And you have seen the results. And the very last one, you've seen a 40-day strike. Uh, we can't live off signing bonuses for being on strike for 40 days. That's not negotiations. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't bring the membership together. That doesn't make, uh, that doesn't compress us into one union. It would still be a split union. A 40-day strike didn't do anything for two tiers. 40 day strike didn't do anything for insurance that you just mentioned, didn't do anything for defined pensions, and it didn't do anything for future retires or current retires. So there's gotta be, there's gotta be a better way to go to the table and uh, negotiate a contract and make the company know that you cannot continuously treat the UAW members, especially the younger seniority people, the way that you've been treating them. They have made you filthy rich. And I mean filthy rich. And naturally the UAW board was confronted with corruption. And that's been a real scar to this union. 
And it's one that will not leave for a long period of time. And believe me, that was very painful when I was notified about what was going on in this union. I mean, when you got two presidents that are supposed to be leading this membership uh, and setting an example throughout this country as a union, and all they read about is corruption, corruption, and not did it. And where did it stop? After 15, 16 people being charged and sentenced and found guilty on their own, basic, all of them. Uh, I don't know how the union got there. I truthfully don't. Like I said, I spent 16 years and I knew some people that uh, their heart and soul was in this union. And I'm talking about presidents like Doug Frazier, talking about presidents like Owen Bieber, Steve Yokish. I have had the opportunity to be in negotiations with two of them and very close to the very first one, Doug Frazier, when I was chairman at Local 136 and we had to take a concessionary agreement. So that's your board, and that's the best way I can describe them. And then I'll go to the other group that I think is pushing uh, hard uh, and probably will be presenting a slate and actually a candidate for president. Uh, I am uh, a little, uh, I guess, hostile at some of the things they have said. And what I mean by that is, they, they, they put out the United All Workers for our Democracy, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing any of that. They supported the, the one member, one vote, uh, and they celebrated after it won by 64%. I supported the one member, one vote, and so did a, 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 an individual that was working with me and has been working with me, Tony Candelo. Uh, who has uh, been a president and on the bargaining committee uh, when I was in, in 1999. We vote, we have visit retirees. We have talked to active members and we were in full support of 1M1B, especially at the corruption that hit the UAW. But in saying that, I do not, and I will not ever support model in this country or this union after the Teamsters. I am totally opposed to that. I don't know if the United All Workers for Democracy understand one thing. I've been in this union over 55 years. This union stood tall in negotiations. This union was respected. They set the example through the uh, unions at the bargaining table. This union was noted as a business union. And the only priority was, was the membership at the bargaining table. Now, unfortunately, as we described, as I described earlier, some of that's been lost. But for the UAWD to make the statement that our union members uh, had a steady decline in their standard of living for the last four decades, and that's what they put out. I, I, I need to say that is disgraceful to make that statement. Uh, going back 40 years for a quick example in, in 1982, 1980s, uh, Chrysler and GM was on the verge of bankruptcy. And I was chairman at that time uh, in Local 136. And we had to march on Washington to see if we could convince senators and congressmen to afford a bailout. Doug Frazier spent night after night, hours after hours, trying to convince the politicians that you had to support a concessionary package that he would present uh, to the membership. And if that was completed, to vote for the bailout for GM and uh, Chrysler. And Doug Frazier delivered. And it was not easy. There was a lot of disagreement in regards to a concessionary package within Chrysler and GM. But fortunately, Doug Frazier was the leader he was. And he saved Chrysler and he probably saved definitely uh, GM. Now for somebody to say that for four decades, this union didn't do anything is about the most dishonest thing I've heard. 
Owen Beaver, after the 80s were all done, all the concessions that we gave up, we got back. And not only got back, there was a package negotiated that the workers that gave up the concessions in Chrysler got stuck. And we didn't think it was much then because it wasn't worth any. Six, seven, eight years later, the stock was worth between ten to $15,000. 1990 come, Owen Beaver took over as president. He negotiated the 90 to 93 agreement. Both of them were ratified by the membership with a comfortable ratification. 96 to 99, I was personally involved as the lead negotiator for the Chrysler Department, along with Stephen P. Yokich. I want to make sure that they understand some. Some contracts were ratified by 78% and by 86%. Now that is not declining the standard of living for the UA Denver work. That's increasing the standard of living for the UA Denver workers. So you went out and you beat up three presidents that give their heart and soul for this union. Doug Frazier is the president, Owen Beaver is the president, and Stephen P. Yorkins is the president. I don't know if anybody that I know of in the UAWD that knows, a lot, knows how to negotiate better on toast yet. Yeah. And they may very well do, and if they do, I applaud. But there's one thing I will not let you do, is beat up this international union for four decades saying they did nothing for this membership. They very well could not be a Chrysler or GM today if it wasn't for Doug Frazier. Now, to get back to this Teamster model, uh, I don't know if the membership is familiar with what, teamster, what the Teamster model is or the basics of the Teamsters is. I, I believe it's doing one thing and I could be wrong. And if I do, I apologize. I believe it's for one reason. The Teamsters retires do not have a right to vote or run. And they want to model after them. And I think that's exactly what their goal is. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. But I'll say this, when we voted for one member, one vote, the referendum, referendum vote was quite clear. What it said was, if you're a member in good standing, and it identified who that is, temporary employees, reinstated employees, and all retirees. I think that language was quite clear who the qualifiers would be if it got passed. It didn't say that now we got the new procedure and that means that retirees can't run or vote. That is not what it said. It gave them the entitlement to make that determination who was qualified. Now I know the monitor uh, has a tendency and they even believe it that they get certain, I guess, I don't know if it's favors, but he has a tendency to listen to them more than anybody else. I'll only tell our membership this, make sure that they don't take your right away. And when I say membership, I mean retirees that want to vote and retirees that want to run. This, this union has been one, not two. When we say membership, the definition is one million plus. So I say to you, don't let this happen to our union. Why would you be afraid to let a retiree vote or retire to run, especially if there's qualified people in the retired area that can maybe do more than anybody else that's running in this campaign. So that's your choices. And naturally, you know who I am. I have walked you through that. I had the, I have the experience. I believe I know how, I have the know-how and I would be honored and privileged to have the right to be president of UAW. Thank you, John. You make some great points, and uh, your experience is definitely shines. What would you say was the toughest contract that you negotiated? Well, there was one that I, I was very proud of, and it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, the world of today. The question is, what? feelings do the membership have for the international union? Is it one of leadership? I don't think that's there. Is it one of integrity? 
Is it one of collective bargaining? Uh, I don't think any of them colleagues are there anymore. It's a, it's, it's, it's a feeling of uh, we're left out. Nobody knows we're here anymore. Uh, we want to be part of what's going on in this union. We want to be at the same level as this union. And I'll give you a quick example and I'll try to make it quick. They asked me to do a contract at local 5285 and it's called, back then it was called Freightliner. I, I believe today it's called Diamond Freightliner. And I went in there with two other staff guys, about two of our staff guys. And when we got there, uh, we didn't really know the bargaining committee or the membership at all, because this was new to me. They asked me to go do this. So what, upon, it was in uh, Mount Holly, North Carolina, was where the plants that so we were negotiating in Charlotte. When we met with the bargaining committee, uh, it, they weren't disrespectful, but <laughs> it was very cold in the room. And I mean, extremely cold. There was no warmth for one another. There was no togetherness for one another. Uh, when the meeting broke up and I talked to the staff, I had to say to them, this is not going to be easy. Uh, normally we have a good rapport with most uh, bargaining committees, but this one was not what it was supposed to be. So the question is, how are we gonna bring this together for our membership? Well, we weren't coming up with many answers after two or three days. And we met with the company and their position is that don't work too hard because we're not gonna give you anything. Uh, we'll give them a, a little envelope the day before the deadline date and they'll probably sign it. And that's probably the way this negotiations will go. And I said, oh really, is that what is that the way it's gonna go? And they kind of indicated, yeah, that's the way it's been going. So anyway, the only answer I had was I told the chairman, I want a membership meeting. And he indicated, John, nobody will show up. And I said, well, let's find out. So we moved forward with it. We notified him and we had the meeting. We had 58 people show up out of 2,200. Approximately 58, give or take. Well, I explained what I could explain to them. They asked me the questions, I answered them. And we moved on to the second week and nothing was changing whatsoever. So I called for another meeting of the membership. Ah, we got maybe 120, 112, somewhere in there. Pretty much the same scenario. Nothing was happening. No movement at the table. Martin committee still was cold as ice and we weren't making no progress in our meetings with the membership. So about the third week, I had a very good uh, health and safety rep, an international rep by the name of Jim Howe. Really extremely a good person. He's been in a lot of negotiations with me. I told him, notify the company that we're going into plant to check on health and safety items. So he did. So I entered, I entered into the plant and uh, probably five, six hours, I had an opportunity to be in there. I talked to all the people uh, three hours on days and about two and a half, three hours on nights. And oh, they were just asking a million questions. And I told them, why don't you come to the meeting and ask these questions so everybody can hear them? Because everybody's probably got the same concern and you probably got some questions that other people haven't thought of. And I spent a lot of time in there. Well, we finally had another meeting. We had about 500 people at the meeting. And there was a new look on the bargaining uh, committee. And when we went to meet with the company, you know, you can only be patient so long, then you got to unload. So I did, I did my unloading on them, hot and heavy, and told them that little envelope you're passing the day before the contract. I wish you the best of luck with it, but I don't think it'll work. And they said, it's always worked before it'll work now. Well, we're into the fourth week and this is the week of the, the contract supposed to expire. So we had one more meeting and we had around 1500 people at this meeting. And we had a committee now that believed we were there to help them. And it almost took four weeks to get that done. Well, we explained to the membership, I did that. We still have extracted nothing from the table. And their position is the same. They're going to hand you this little envelope. And I guess you guys are going to grab it and cave and sign it. And I, just, I can pack up and leave town. Or maybe, maybe we ought to show them that we're not easy, that we are a union, and maybe we ought to put them on strike. And what do you think of that? And 
unbelievably, they sit up and scream, strike them. And then I realize that we do have a union and we are going to get a contract that I think we can accomplish in this. We went back, nothing changed with them. We were going on strike and they said, well, you ain't gonna strike us, we're gonna lock you out. I said, do whatever you gotta do. You ain't building no trucks and we're gonna be out in front of that plant picketing and putting our signs up. And that's exactly what we did. And we called a membership meeting and they were proud. They were standing tall. And they realized that myself and the two staff guys, we weren't going to quit. Well, anyway, to end the story real quick, we were on strike four days. And a company called me back in and I sat down, me and their head negotiator heads up and we got done with everything and we got everything that we put on the table. And I took it down to the bargaining committee and I said, check all this out, see if it meets our needs. And I said, let me know, I'll give you, uh, I'll sit here and anything that needs to explain, I'll explain. They went through it, a few questions and everything pretty much in place. And they were just elated with the contract. They couldn't believe it. And there was one demand that the company did not grant me. And it's not, it doesn't put no money in your pocket, but it means something inside you. What that was is the union wanted to fly the UAW flag underneath the American flag in front of the plant. And the company said that will never happen in Mount Holly, North Carolina. So they looked at me and said, John, we didn't get the flag. And I said, no, they wouldn't give it to me. I didn't say that I agreed with this agreement. I just said, I'm bringing it down here for you to review it. How much does that flag mean to you? And her answer was everything. So I said, okay, I'm going back upstairs. I went up back upstairs and I told the negotiator, unfortunately, we don't have an agreement. And he jumped up and did his two and a half like they normally do. And I said, well, I said, you don't have an agreement. And he said, you mean over that flag? And I said, you don't understand what a flag means to the union people. You, you wouldn't know. I don't know if you have a heart like we do when it comes to uh, our pride. So I said, unfortunately, we're going on the bricks again, it looks like. Now, I'm a negotiator, I'm not an idiot. I kind of felt that no company would let this go down over a flag. As I turned around and started walking to the door, before I got my hand on the door, Henry said, you got your flag. I'll draft up the language, bring it down there. I want this thing, contract closed. And I said, you'll get it closed after we review everything and take our time and make sure that that flag you're bringing down, that there will be a ceremony showing that that flag is going up. I said a ceremony. And that means the plant itself and the membership will watch that flag going up that flagpole. And that's the way we settled that agreement. And we took it to the membership and we got a half a block away from where we were going to meeting. You could hear the UAW screaming, are the members screaming UAW, UAW a half a block away. And when we walked through that door, I thought they were going to blow the roof off. That was a membership that was extremely proud. They voted the contract in 97.5. 97.5. And wrote an article in their newspaper the following week said our union and our members have never had more solidarity since that plan has been there. And they were proud of the international coming in and assisting them in the contract. So that has probably been my proudest. That's awesome. That is awesome. And that shows the solidarity and the unity, but it also shows the confidence that that membership had in you and your negotiating skills uh, to go out and extract a good contract. As that Freightliner CEO or negotiator said, used to be they could just pass a letter out and the people would vote on it. 
but they didn't run up against the John Ganan and his negotiating before that. So you set a pretty good tone. And uh, that's something that you'll bring with you to the current uh, UAW. Um, one of the questions that I had is, through all of your negotiations that you've been a part of, and you've been a part of a lot, you've got a, quite a storied history as a negotiator for the UAW and as a servicing rep and everything that went with that, was there any time in, in your opinion that you felt uh, that the membership felt towards the international the way they seem to feel right now? Well, for, fortunately for me, uh, there's one thing you learn about being a negotiator is you do gain a certain amount of respect uh, from the local unions. And what I mean by that is uh, the first contract that I had the privilege of being uh, the head negotiator for the uh, Chrysler Department was in 96. And uh, the bargaining committee is the read to how good you are. And I don't know if a lot of negotiators know that, but uh, you, you have to be able to keep your bargaining committee together. You got to make sure that your bargaining committee is informed on everything that's going on. And what, what I do is, and I, I don't know, it's just things I do that a lot of people, I'm, I'm different in many ways. Uh, and most of my contracts I negotiate in smaller ones like the freight liners and the Mack trucks uh, and the uh, uh, national transplants, I normally take the chairman with me and, and off an awful lot of my meetings so he can get the true flavor of what's going on in the negotiations. I don't like coming in and just dropping all this on uh, the bargaining committee without them actually being part of that in a way. And the chairman is the chairman. He can come back and describe the meeting. He can describe our position, the feeling. And I, uh, that, that makes the committee itself like they are part of the negotiation, not sitting in a room taking up space. There, and, I, and I do something a little bit different. Every time a piece of language comes down that we negotiate, uh, in the morning when we get together, we'd hand it out to all the negotiators. And in doing that, we would read it, we would walk ourselves through it, we make sure nothing is ambiguous whatsoever in regards to that language, because I'm a very, what you call, negotiator that wants to make sure that if I was working on the assembly line tomorrow, which I spent 10 years working on the assembly line, that when I read the contract, I want to make sure I totally understand what it says. You don't have to flower it up with big words. Uh, that does nothing for me. Uh, I'm a blue collar worker. I graduated from high school. Just give me something that I can clearly understand and guess what? I'll understand what you did for me. And I try to do that. And the thing about it is long as you're keeping your Barney committee uh, on top of everything that's going on, you're gonna find out that you've gained an awful lot of respect from them. And I noticed as I moved into different negotiations, your reputation kind of moves with you. And I'll give you an example. When I was at Chrysler, and they asked me to go over and do these truck contracts. Uh, and I use Mac as an example. Uh, before I got there, when we walked there, they said, uh, we hear from the Chrysler people that you really do a nice job for the membership. And uh, uh, we really do appreciate you coming in on this contract. And I'll be honest with you, it was the, 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 the the bargaining committee and, and the staff we brought in, uh, we were all one. Never did they doubt anything we did. Our integrity is strong. Uh, they know that John Ganan only tells you one thing, the truth. You might not like it, but you're gonna get it. And they know if he did tell you that, that's the way it is and that's the way it's gonna be and he'll explain why. And that's something that is not easy, Glenn, to establish. In today's world, 
Uh, I mean, when, when we were doing contracts back then, there was no two tier, as you know. There was nobody that walked into plant in the big three without defined pensions or insurance, as you know. We had COLA, as you know. And we respected the retirees, whether they were future or where they were current. We did not slam the door in their face and forget about them. And unfortunately, we have now for a number of years. So it's kind of like a, you tell a staff, you don't have to pat yourself on the shoulder. You don't have to brag about yourself. Just do your job and guess what happens? They learn who you are and you gain your respect. And that's how you accomplish it. And that's been the way I've been since I've been in the crisis department as a service and rep and as the top AA. John, it's like I said, you've got a good history. You've done a lot of good for the UAW. And uh, the fact that you're jumping in this race now and uh, willing to put yourself out there and do everything you can for this membership just shows a complete selfless attitude. Um, I appreciate it. I, I really do. If anybody wants to get involved and help or they want to learn more about John Ganan, I know we have a John Ganan for president of the International UAW Facebook page. They can send an email to jg for uaw at gmail.com and get on an email list and get updates about your campaign. They can email questions in and we can get responses for them. Is there any other way that you would like to have people communicate? I know we're talking about another Zoom call uh, and opening that up for questions. Yeah, uh, one thing that uh, is not your number one priority with me is uh, I definitely want the membership to uh, get involved in our campaign. Uh, we we are a, we are a campaign of of. Uh, of no money. We're not. We're not money players. We're doing all this with good people, hard work. Uh, what costs we have, and it's not been a lot. I pretty well have taken care of, and a, a friend of mine, Tony Candela, who's been with me all the way. Uh, we will. We will be asking for help. Make no mistake, because we got to compete with everybody else, and uh, uh, we have talked to the leadership. Uh, many of them are working hard for us. Uh, we know that. Uh, we're going to uh, travel. Uh, we're planning on coming, going to uh, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. And we're going to talk to everybody and anybody that will talk to us, but mostly the membership and the leaderships. And that's so far how we've been running our campaign. Now, we know we have to expand, and actually, I have to get exposed not only into the big three, but to everybody, whether it's aerospace, whether it's agriculture, whether it's nurses, whether it's healthcare, or it's IPS, we are a group that is going to try to get as much face-to-face, eye-to-eye with his membership as possible. Now we know that as this progresses on, there'll be global mailing lists that will, uh, will be entitled to. Uh, nothing in that area is cheap, but we have to compete. And if we don't, uh, we won't have a chance. We want people to know our message. We want people to meet us. But most of all, uh, when we open this up, whether it be like we're doing now on Zoom, uh, we're going to put up a website. We're working on that. Uh, we want to answer every question every member has about uh, this union and what they think we can do at the negotiating table. Uh, and that and that's our goal. And uh, talk to your friends, talk to your fellow workers. But uh, if you hear us and you like us, then uh, ask your friends to tune in and, and meet us. And that's pretty much what, what we're doing things, Clint. All right, John. I just checked my notes and we do have another Zoom that we're working on getting on the schedule for next Tuesday. 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Central Daylight Time. That's one that we're going to open up for questions. We'll be posting links on social media. And anybody who wants to get in, we'll be able to get into that and submit questions for you to answer. Um, one last time, I want to remind everybody the John Ganan for President of the International Union is the Facebook page. Go to it for updates. 
You can ask questions there. John will answer every question that you have. And also the email is jg4 at gmail.com. So um, get involved. You have an opportunity to help save this union. You have an opportunity to be involved and make it back to the greatness that it once was. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to take somebody that has been there before, somebody that knows how to negotiate, and somebody that's not afraid to fight for this membership. So, John, I appreciate you coming on the table talk on labor front. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I'd just like, just like to thank you for having me. Uh, just one little comment, and I'll close out here, is that don't let 78 scare you off. Uh, there is people that will say, and, and I accept it, that 78 is old. Well, uh, I'm not going to debate an issue about 78, but I want to tell you one thing that is old. What is really old is what's happened in the last four contracts. And then people weren't old. So when you think about you and your family, think about who the best person is that can sit across that table and hopefully extract uh, what you need for you and your family. So thank you very much, Glenn. I appreciate it. John, thanks. I wanted to get the email out there one more time to make sure I got it right. That's J is in John, G is in Ganan, the number four, John Ganan, JG4, <laughs> JG4UAW at gmail.com. JG4UAW at gmail.com. Um, thanks for coming on the show. We'll have another one next Tuesday. We'll open it up for questions. Everybody think about what you might want to ask John if you have a chance, because the opportunity will be there. John, thank you very much. With that said, this is Labor Front. We're out. Mm -hmm.